Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rudder, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. So before we begin, I wanted to share some background. American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC, was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. We continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid feature on the current slide. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. There are over 360 species of hummingbirds and as a family, they fall into every level of the ABC pyramid. Today, you'll hear from our panelists about this incredible group of birds that is only found in the Western hemisphere. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. David Wiedenfeld, he is ABC's senior conservation scientist he received his PhD from Florida State University and his work has focused on bird population ecology and conservation biology. He served for five years as director of research at the Sutton Avian Research Center, working primarily on prairie chickens. He was also head of the Department of Vertebrae Ecology at the Charles Darwin Research Station in the Galapagos Islands. His work was primarily with bird populations, but also included projects on invasive species, including predators, diseases, and parasites. Sherry Williamson is a lifelong naturalist, birder, ornithologist, and conservationist, known internationally for her research on hummingbirds. She is co-founder and director slash naturalist of the Southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory, garden manager at Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary in Southeastern Arizona, and author of A Field Guide to Hummingbirds of North America in the Peterson Field Guide series. Tim Meehan is a quantitative ecologist for National Audubon Society, working with staff and volunteers at the local, state, and national level to find signals in large data sets that originate from Audubon's numerous community science programs. David is going to start things off by sharing an overview of these incredible birds. Hi, I'm David Wiedenfeld. Um, hummingbirds come in all sorts, but as you know, they're only found in the Caribbean and in the Americas. There are no hummingbirds in Europe, Asia, Africa, or Australia. Here in the Americas, though, we have a lot of hummingbirds, uh, as Jordan mentioned, about 360 species, although most of those live in the tropics. Hummingbirds, of course, are very dependent on flowers. So they usually have to live in, in places where there are a lot of flowers year round. And that usually means warm places. Here in the US and Canada, where winters can be cold, there are about 17 or 18 species, mostly in the Western US, but getting up as far as Alaska. There are fewer as we move northward and eastward, so that in the Eastern part of North America, we really only have one species, the ruby-throated I mean. Hummingbirds can tolerate a range of climates, though, uh, from hot deserts to pretty cold places. If it's a very hot place, they may be less active in the warmest part of the day. In cold places where they naturally occur, like Alaska or southern Yukon, they can still nest and, and raise young with special adaptations that allow them to reduce their metabolism and save energy at night. Hummingbirds have a high metabolism, so they need a good energy source. Flower nectar is a really good one. It's basically sugar, but they also eat insects, usually very small ones, because they need protein as well. Some insects they catch in the air, others they take from flowers as they visit them. And they also like to visit spider webs and rob the webs of, of small insects. Next. Hummingbirds, of course, are important pollinators of plants. Many plants have flowers that have co-evolved with hummingbirds. That is, the flower provides nectar to the hummingbirds when they need it, but they have their stamens placed to the flowers, placed so the birds can get pollen on them in the right places, so they can be dropped off at the next flower the bird visits, ensuring that the flowers get uh, pollinated. Sometimes you can even see it all over their head and face, like this Allen's hummingbird. Even if a feeder is available, hummingbirds like to visit flowers. It's what they do. 
So they are likely still pollinating plants in the surrounding area, even though they visit the feeder. Next. Because hummingbirds and flowers work together, the flowers want to be seen and noticed by the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds can see ultraviolet light, so some flowers have very bright patterns in ultraviolet that the birds can see. Humans can't see these patterns. Next. Hummingbirds are tiny, of course, so their nests are too. The nests are usually well camouflaged, often with bits of lichen, bark, or other plant materials from nearby their nest. This makes the nest blend in with the branch they're built on. Sometimes the nest is held together with spider web. They usually have a very soft lining where the two white, very oblong eggs are laid. The little hummers take a couple of weeks to hatch and are in the nest for two and a half to three weeks before fledging. Then they're off. When baby hummers leave the nest, they just zoom away like their parents, although maybe not as strongly or as far. Mom will keep feeding them for another week or so, and by then they'll be flying like the adults. Of course, hummers face many threats in the modern world, and with habitat loss being one of the most significant. Providing habitat is an important way to help hummers, and a good way to provide, do that is hummingbird gardening. And that's what we're here for today, to talk about gardening. So I'll pass this on and, and let uh, Sherry uh, talk to you about actual gardening. Yes, thanks. Thanks, David. So Sherry, take it away. You betcha. Let's see here. So as David was saying, the uh, hummingbirds are miniature marvels. They are extraordinary little creatures that are as magical as they are natural. And many people uh, really just don't think of hummingbirds as being truly real. They think of them as more like some mythical being. And yet, for those of us here in the new world, they are a backyard phenomenon. But not everybody is able to attract hummingbirds to their own personal outdoor space. So how do you do that? Well, the very best way to do that is to provide habitat. Hummingbirds do not live in a vacuum. They have to have all the same natural resources that any wild creature has. They, they need food, they need water, they need shelter. And because they're migratory birds, they need these in, in different quantities at different times of the year. So we need to be able to figure out ways to provide within our own personal human spaces, the kinds of resources that hummingbirds need. Start with flowers. Flowers are absolutely the number one way to attract hummingbirds to your own personal space. Now that personal space can be a massive uh, exurban uh, lot with acres of space to plant flowers. It can be an ordinary backyard or it can be something as simple as a balcony or a patio if you live in a small space with, without a lot of access to outdoors for gardening. Any, any outdoor space, uh, even you know a fifth floor balcony in a high rise apartment building, can still be used to attract hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are very resourceful and they do find those flowers. Flowers are really important uh, because it does help to stimulate their natural behaviors. You get a chance to see them at work, to see them doing the things that hummingbirds do, uh, including feeding at flowers and watching them interact with the flowers, like the little, this little coastus hummingbird feeding at a salvia. Flowers also help to attract other wildlife, including other pollinators such as butterflies, and they also attract the kinds of insects that hummingbirds eat, as well as that are eaten by other native predators. They connect your yard with surrounding habitats. If you're planting the native flowers that are found in natural habitats near your own yard, near your own outdoor space, then you've got uh, birds and other pollinators, other animals moving back and forth between the native plants in your own yard and the plants out in the surrounding habitats. And again, if you are providing natural native flowers, that's also providing a wide range of resources for other wildlife. And you may be bringing in pollinators such as this carpenter bee, other native bees, butterflies, all kinds of little insects that may provide food for hummingbirds and other predators. Uh, and it, uh, it just makes your yard more a part of the environment that you're in. A hummingbird garden, it's good to start with the hot colors 
hummingbirds do have a very wide visual range, as David was alluding to. Uh, but the hot end of the spectrum is very important to them, in part because those hot end of the spectrum colors, the reds, the oranges, the intense pinks, are not as easily visible to insects, which see very, very well in the yellow and blue and ultraviolet range, but they don't see so well in the red end of the range, most of them. So starting with the hot colors, that's always a good foundation for your hummingbird garden. It's going to catch the bird's eyes as they come by. But if you have the space and the time, you can also build a rainbow because there's many, many kinds of, of flowers that are readily visited by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are adaptable little creatures and will feed from almost anything. We wouldn't be able to feed them out of plastic bottles of sugar water if they weren't adaptable and, and curious little creatures. So you can have a rainbow in your hummingbird garden. It doesn't have to be all reds and oranges and, and hot pinks. Among the basics for a hummingbird garden are to grow native. These are plants that are adapted to your local weather and your local soil types. They're going to resist your native pests as well. A lot of the common garden pests that may trouble your roses or your magnolia trees or your, your um, butterfly bushes or whatever are not going to be as much of a problem for the native plants that are adapted to life with those uh, insect pests. They're also familiar to the birds. Even a bird that's, that's never visited a yard or garden before, that's only ever been out in the wild, has probably had uh, contact with those wild plants that you are growing in your garden. So that's a good reason to grow them, uh, grow native plants is to make sure that the birds know what they're getting when they come to your yard. And again, they also tend to integrate better with your local ecosystem. If you've got your local native plants, they're going to provide pollen to cross pollinate with the native plants uh, outside your yard, maybe in other people's yards, but maybe in a natural area nearby, in a green belt or park or uh, nature reserve. So you are making your yard a part of the ecosystem when you plant native plants in it. You also want to select plants to bloom throughout the season. Now your season, if you live up far in the north, it may be very short, but you want to have plants that are blooming when the first hummingbirds arrive in the spring. And you want to have plants that continue blooming off and on throughout the summer, right up to the very end of the season when the last of the hummingbirds are moving out. You also want to diversify your garden. A lot of people just plant uh, annuals or maybe a few perennials, but consider if you have room and sp uh, space for these things, consider adding woody shrubs, trees and vines such as coral honeysuckle and cross vine trumpet creeper, if you have room for trumpet creeper, that's a biggie. But all of those are plants that can help diversify and make sure that there's something for all of your hummingbird clientele when they come to visit your yard. Another extremely important fundamental, as David was saying uh, in his presentation, hummingbirds do eat a lot of little invertebrates. They eat insects, they eat spiders, and that's particularly important food when the females are feeding their young ones in the nest. So broad spectrum pesticides really have no place in a hummingbird garden. Targeted pest management, the thing to do to figure out what pests you have and how to specifically deal with that pest, whether it's a hard spray of water under the leaves to get rid of aphids, or maybe it's a, it's a, 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 a Bacillus thuringiensis derivative that gets rid of caterpillars, you know, cutworms and bloopers and things like that but anything that will not just poison everything it comes in contact with. You not only don't want to directly poison the hummingbirds by poisoning their food source, but you also don't want to eliminate that food source that's so critically important to them. It's also good to not be too uh, tidy a gardener because those spiders uh, are, do provide food for them, but they also provide a critical building material. The very strong sticky silk of spider webs is a critical element in the nests of all of our North American hummingbirds. You can also combine feeders with your garden, or you can have feeders alone, depending on what your personal situation is, what your needs are, what your space uh, availability is. And feeding hummingbirds, as long as it's done correctly, is not harmful to the birds and, in fact, can really help them in situations where natural food is not available to them, at least not in the quantity that, that they really need. The pros of feeding include that feeders are very easily combined with flowers. If you already have a garden, even if it's not hummingbird pollinated flower, you can stick a couple of feeders out there to get hummingbirds coming to your garden and then gradually build your garden to include more hummingbird pollinated flowers. It's also, for a lot of people, it's just more practical than maintaining a huge irrigated garden out here in the desert Southwest where I live. 
uh, putting hundreds of gallons of, of water a day on a garden maybe isn't the best idea in a lot of places. Uh, but it, uh, it definitely having the flowers and the feeders together is good if you can manage it. Also, feeders do not keep birds from migrating, nor do they keep them from visiting native flowers. We do see hummingbirds visiting feeders that are just caked with multiple colors of pollen. So we know that the birds are out there visiting the flowers even when there are feeders available, uh, which is sometimes frustrating for people who don't have flowers but do have feeders, that they're not getting the hummingbirds visiting. We, there are downsides to feeding though, uh, including the fact that if we're really wasteful with sugar, that sugar is grown at tremendous environmental cost. Every acre of sugar cane is an acre of a tropical or subtropical habitat that once was home to hundreds or thousands of different species of plants and animals. And so we have to be aware that we are robbing Peter to pay Paul when we're putting this tropical grown sugar into our hummingbird feeders. Also inadequate maintenance of feeders may expose the birds to diseases and parasites. Uh, certainly we see a lot of birds infected with, um, with uh, uh, what appears to be avian pox with swellings around their faces, lesions on their bills that may have picked up the virus for avian pox from hummingbird feeders. They may also pick up uh, the, the sorts of uh, organisms that can cause the throat infections that people call tongue fungus. It's actually candida albicans, a yeast infection. Uh, they may be able to pick that up from dirty feeders as well. So feeder maintenance is extremely important. What you put in your feeder is also extremely important. We're mimicking nature here. And surprisingly enough, it doesn't have to be very complicated because nature's basic recipe is the same as the basic recipe we recommend for hummingbird feeders. White granulated sugar, which is sucrose, a natural plant sugar that is the same exact uh, sugar that's in the sap and nectar of the wildflowers that hummingbirds are feeding from, and just good quality water. That's all you really need. That is the basic recipe even for natural nectar. There are other things in natural nectar, but those are the two basic components that are found in every nectar of every hummingbird pollinated flower, sucrose and water. The ratio is a, is a little more flexible. Uh, three parts to four parts water uh, to one part sugar is a good ratio to use from fall through spring when the birds are dealing with more uh, challenges with cooler weather, if you're lucky enough to have hummingbirds through the winter. Uh, if it, you live in an area with, with really hot summers, as most of us do, more of us do all the time, a four parts water or five parts water ratio to one part sugar gives them a little more water at times when they really need that water because they need that water to help themselves stay cool. So making it a little weaker in the summer is good. You can always offer one feeder that has a weaker solution, one feeder that has a stronger solution and let the birds decide. Another thing to be aware of is that iron is toxic to hummingbirds in, in excess of what they get in their normal diet. It's found in some tap water, your, your well water or surface water may have excess iron in it if it leaves an orange stain under the tap. And it's also found in organic sugar at different levels. The browner the sugar, the more iron it contains. So if you're going to use organic sugar and we don't really recommend it, use the lightest, whitest organic sugar that you can find to ensure that it has the least iron and is the least problematical for the birds. One more thing, and this is something to leave out, is red dye. Dye of any kind, whether it's a synthetic dye or an artificial dye, it's just not natural. It's not something the birds would normally be taking in when they're taking a natural nectar. So there's no reason to put it in. There's plenty of red on the outside of the feeders to attract them. Leave the dye out. It's probably harmful at the rates that hummingbirds consume. Keeping those feeders clean, you got to clean them inside and out and clean them regularly every one to two days in hot weather when there's more likely to be fermentation of the solution, when insects are more active and may get into the solution and pollute it, when there's pollen in the air that may filter in and contaminate the solution. In cooler weather, every three to five days is okay. Always give your solution the smell test and eyeball it to see if there's any, any uh, odor of, of fermentation or any stuff floating around in there. Disinfecting feeders inside and out is also good. The three most popular disinfectants for to use for hummingbird feeders are a highly diluted chlorine bleach solution. And that's only maybe one part chlorine bleach in 20 parts water. Or full strength white vinegar, which is very good at killing a lot of the yeasts, bacteria and viruses that would tend to contaminate hummingbird feeders. My personal favorite is hydrogen peroxide. 
Again, spray it inside and out. Uh, it's very good, uh, has very good activity against all the kinds of things that tend to contaminate hummingbird feeders. And it's easier on your nose. It might cause your hangnails to sting a little bit, but it's easier on your nose than either bleach or vinegar. Brush those feeders inside and out, including the porch, which you can lose, use like a little spoolie brush from a mascara tube uh, or pipe cleaners, you know, if you have them to remove any debris from the porch and rinse them really thoroughly, allow them to air dry. It's always good to have multiple feeders so you can have one set inside being cleaned and drying while the other set are outside in use. A lot of folks complain about bee problems and uh, this can kind of come and go depending on what resources the bees have available to them. The biggest problem bee around hummingbird feeders are honeybees, which are not native. They're an invasive alien species or maybe they're from the hive that your neighbor down the street maintains in their backyard. But honeybees are, tend to be the most problematical around feeders. Feeder design is very, very important. Bee problems are often feeder problems. The way the feeder is designed either denies the bees access to the sugar water or lets them get to it. If you're having problems with your feeder and they're just swarming all over it like this, you may wanna be more careful about how you hang your feeder, wash it off with a little clean water before you, you uh, go back inside the house or get a feeder like these saucer feeders on the left side of the image that you can control the liquid level and keep it out of the reach of the bees. One other thing that's important in considering what kind of feeder to get is that yellow is a very common color for bee pollinated flowers. And so it's best to avoid feeders with yellow parts. It may not make a difference depending on what kinds of bees are in your area and how much of a bee problem you have, but there's no point in inviting bees in by showing them little yellow flowers that look just like the natural flowers that they're accustomed to feeding from. You can also add water to your yard. Hummingbirds love water. They like misters, they like bathing, they like thin sheets of running water. There are lots of YouTube videos on how to make your own hummingbird uh, bathe spa. Uh, but you have to keep those feeders clean, the, the water features clean, especially if other birds are using them. You don't wanna spread disease. And you can also put out nesting material for hummingbirds. Short natural fibers, like a half inch to an inch long, nothing that can get wrapped around their feet. And wool, Clean cotton and clean pesticide-free pest pet hair are really, really good for nest construction. Hummingbirds also use a lot of uh, calcium when they're making eggshells. So putting out clean wood ashes or even baked ground up eggshell are good sources of calcium for females when they're nesting. And that's it. Thanks so much, Sherry. Sure. Friendly reminder to everyone that we are recording this webinar, so no worries if you couldn't copy down all of that great information that Sherry shared. And we'll be sending a follow-up email to registrants with all of the links and information as well. We also encourage you to use the actual Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions, since this will help us better track all of your questions and reply to them instead of losing them in the chat. But with that, we're now going to hear from Tim. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I uh, am going to talk about some research that um, the science team at the National Audubon Society has completed recently. And it's related to all those um, tips that we've heard from Sherry on how to attract hummingbirds to your yard. Okay, next slide. So Audubon, the National Audubon Society, like many other nonprofit organizations, have, uh, have programs where we um, work with folks on, on how to attract birds to their, uh, to their yards. It's called the Plants for Birds program. And um, part of that program is um, a database called the Nat Native Plant Database. And you can go to the next slide. So the, the Plants for Bird database um, is, a, is a resource for, for all of you to use. You can basically type in your town or your, your zip code, and it will give you a list of uh, native plants that uh, you can plant in your yard. And the list is kind of geared towards your, your local growing conditions. So um, if you live in the Southwest, it'll pick out plants that will grow well in the Southwest um, and so on and so forth. And it will also tell you the types of uh, critters that are going to be attracted to those types of plants. So if you're focused on hummingbirds, then there's a way to find out if a particular plant is really geared towards hummingbirds or not. Okay, next slide. Another program that Audubon has is a program called Hummingbirds at Home. And Hummingbirds at Home is also a, um, 
a program oriented towards uh, helping folks attract hummingbirds to their home or birds to their home, but it's focused specifically on hummingbirds. But there's also an additional component to it. Uh, part of the program is geared towards uh, helping folks get hummingbirds to their yards, and part of the program is actually monitoring um, hummingbirds in the yards. And so if you go to the next slide, we can see that um, uh, Audubon has, has produced a, a smartphone application, and the smartphone application can be used to create a patch. Um, and then what would happen is you would create a patch, um, you describe the patch, about what flowers are in it, you know, it might be your yard or whatever. And, uh, and then you can use the app also to record observations and those observations all go into a central database. And that helps us understand the effectiveness of the different recommendations that we make. So if you go to the next slide, the patches that uh, people um, record through the Hummingbirds at Home program vary quite a bit. They could be uh, folks yard or garden, they could be um, planter boxes on a porch, uh, or they could be local parks. Next, next slide. And the way that the app, the way that the app works is basically you describe your patch, the number of flowers of this species or that species, and there are visual guides to the different flower species. And then also there's a uh, data entry um, part to the app where you can do a timed survey and you can make notes about what birds visited and where and which plants they visited. Okay, next slide. All right, next slide. So uh, this program has been going on, Hummingbirds at Home has been going on since uh, 2013. And, and um, a year or so ago, we extracted all the data that we had from 2013 through 2018 um, all, on all of these patch surveys. And it turns out that we wound up with 4,000 patch surveys that people had submitted at 700 different locations across the US. And you can see the, these, these gray points on the map are the locations of all the different patch surveys that folks had submitted through this program and through that app. Okay, the next slide. So what we wanted to know is, well, all right, well, are these recommendations that we make to folks on how to get hummingbirds into your yard, your yard is there actual evidence that, that, um, that, that they're effective? And so, what we did is we extracted all the information from all those different 4,000 sites. And we, um, for each of those different observations, those patch surveys, we uh, found out if there was a hummingbird feeder in the local patch, if there were how many plant species there were, flowering plant species, what proportion of those species were native plants, and also what, what did the neighborhood look like? Is it a high, sort of a, a very green neighborhood or not a very green neighborhood? And we conducted some statistical analysis and found that, sure enough, that um, if you have hummingbird feeders in your garden, then you're considerably more likely to, uh, to see hummingbirds. If you have more plant species in the garden, then you're considerably more likely to see hummingbirds. And so I guess I should, I should use my mouse here to, to show you what's going on here. So here's hummingbird feeder in the, in the patch. No. And yes, and you can see that there's a there's an increase here when you go when you add hummingbird feeders. This plot right here, um, basically on this axis is as you plant more plant more species of um, flowering plants in your garden, you have a higher likelihood of seeing hummingbirds. Um, down here in the lower left, as as the proportion of your plants in your yard become more and more native, you have a higher uh, a higher probability of seeing hummingbirds in your yard. And finally, as you, if you live in a greener neighborhood, so if there's less concrete in your, um, in your neighborhood, then you're more likely to see them. And if there's more concrete, then you're less likely to see them. So these are the, these kind of align with the basic um, recommendations that, that Audubon gives through their plants for bird programs and their hummingbird at home programs. And also with what a lot of experts um, uh, recommend, such as Sherry. Okay, next slide. Now, you probably won't be able to read this, um, this table here, but we were able to sort of identify the various species of plants that were most visited on this end of the table and least visited on this end of the table. And this will be a recorded presentation, so if you want to go back 
and, and revisit this table you're, you're, you're able to. But you can see that the, 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 the plants that were visited the most, somewhere around you know, 70 to 90% of the time, tend to be these native plants. And the ones that tend to be visited the least, more on the order of 10% of the time, are several of these introduced species. OK, next slide. So the take home message from all that is that if you have a hummingbird feeder, you're more likely to see hummingbirds in your backyard. Um, if you have high plant diversity, then you're, you're more likely to see more hummingbirds th than if you do not. If you have a large proportion of native plants, you're likely to see more hummingbirds. And if you live in a relatively green neighborhood, um, you are more likely to see hummingbirds. And that's all I have for now. Thanks so much, Tim. We're now going to transition to the Q&A portion of the presentation, which is usually everyone's favorite. Um, so if I can have all of the presenters, please turn your videos on. We're going to start with some of the questions that came in during the registration, and then we'll move on to the live questions that we've been getting in the Q&A box in the chat. So uh, this, this actually is one of my own that I just thought of. Uh, as people are coming in, and this is the backgrounds. Um, Sherry, especially a lot of folks would like to know the plant that is in your background and then the species of hummingbirds in ours. So I'll just uh, share it that I have a calliope hummingbird in my background. And then if we could go in the order of presentation. So David, Sherry, Tim. Mine's a broad tail hummingbird. And my flower background is one of our beautiful Rocky Mountain region plants. This is Ipomopsis aggregata or skyrocket, red gilia. And I don't really know what hummingbird is in my background. Maybe Sherry can help me. It's an Anna's. Anna's hummingbird, thank you. Anna's hummingbird. <laughs> Great, and then Gemma Radko has one of our South American hummingbirds. Yes, that's a blue-throated hill star and it was actually discovered fairly recently. So unfortunately, you're not gonna get that in your backyard. <laughs> Unless you live in Southwestern Ecuador, right? <laughs> exactly. And then thank you for joining us, Erica. Ruby Topaz Hummingbird, I think. Wonderful. So now to the actual questions um, and I'm gonna, uh, anyone can jump in, but I'll direct the questions to one of our panelists to start. So this first one is going to go to David. Um, someone wrote in that they noticed a drop in the number of hummingbirds that they have seen and attracted to their yard over the past few years. Is this a trend that other people are noticing and experiencing? So maybe you can speak to both that and then overall hummingbird numbers. Yeah, so, um, so some of the hummingbird species have in the US and Canada have been declining over, over the last few years, like Rufins and Allen's hummingbirds. But others are, are actually increasing, like black-throated hummingbird and ruby-throated hummingbird. So, um, so it sort of depends on, on where you are. Um, but if you've noticed a, a quick decline over a year or two or something like that in, in your in your yard that very likely relates to just the the local habitat in your yard or in your neighborhood so uh, maybe a, a housing development or or a, something may have removed some of their habitat uh, or uh, or neighbors have have uh, have uh, been removing plants or changing the, the plants in their yards. So, uh, so it, it could very easily be related to, to habitat loss. And to help with that, of course, hummingbird gardening uh, and, uh, and try to get your neighbors involved as well, get them to, to plant some, some plants as well, and not use pesticides and, and uh, those things. Wonderful. So our next question uh, is, I'm going to start with Sherry. A lot of folks have asked for more information about actual feeder location and timing. So feeder location, meaning in the shade, near flowers, can it be near my house? How far away? So if there's any, gen and 
I know this will really depend on your area, but if there are any general tips on where to start. Well, it, it, it does depend on your area. And some of it depends on whether you're just starting out with feeding hummingbirds, if you're putting out a feeder for the first time, or whether you already have something in your yard, whether it's flowers or feeders to attract hummingbirds. If hummingbirds are already visiting your yard, then you can put the feeder where you need it to be, which we really prefer that feeders be in the shade if possible, because we don't want the sun beating down on it. That can cause uh, accelerate the, the fermentation of the solution. We don't really want that. Uh, also good to try to keep it out of the rain. So if it can be under the eaves of your house, that's good as well. Uh, but those aren't the best places for those traveling birds, those birds that are just flying by, not the best places for them to see those feeders. So if you're just putting out feeders for the first time, it's good to put them out where the birds can really see them in the most open part of your yard and then bring them gradually closer and closer to where you want them to be where you can watch them from your living room window or your, your desk in your home office, since so many of us are working from home these days, uh, or you know the edge of the patio where you sit and enjoy your coffee on a Sunday morning. Uh, so there, there's kind of a conflict between where we need the feeders to be for the birds to find them and where they really ought to be for ease of maintenance and, and minimizing problems such as overheated nectar causing the fermentation to go nuts. It is one thing that is good to do is to keep your hummingbird feeders a little bit apart from any seed feeders that you may have in the yard. Uh, you really don't want to have the, the house finches and sparrows and, and nuthatches and things like that coming in and pooping on your feeders. The, some of these songbirds may actually use your feeders, including some species of warblers, woodpeckers are rather fond of hummingbird feeders in certain times and places, but you kind of don't want them getting on the hummingbird feeders and pooping on them, sitting right over the top of them on the shepherd's crook or whatever. Uh, so keeping them a little bit apart from any seed feeders helps to minimize cross-contamination between what your songbirds are doing and what your hummingbirds are doing. Great tips. Thanks, Sherry. Tim, can you tell us a little bit more about any tips you might have for plants in limited gardening areas like apartment buildings or uh, container gardens. Any any specific tips on how to do it, what plants are good, just with that limited space in mind? Yeah, I guess I can't really recommend specific plants because it's going to vary from part from one part of the country to another, from one part of the world to another. But um, but I do know that people have a lot of success um, with container gardens, uh, either window boxes and or uh, big you know, big ceramic pots that they put a bunch of flowers in and regularly get hummingbird visits. Um, I guess the, the few things that come to mind are, maybe Sherry can address this. I'm not sure how good it is to have it close to your window as you know, and or you might want to have it inaccessible to, to your other pets. <laughs> so, uh, so there's not a conflict between your other pets and the hummingbirds. But um, I think that a lot of folks have had good success with, with container gardens. Thanks, Tim. David, the next question is for you. Do the same hummingbird individuals come back to the same location, specifically gardens and feeders, year after year? Um, yeah, they, they do. They, they tend to return to the same area, uh, if not exactly to your yard, maybe to your neighborhood, but, but they, they uh, do tend to, to come back once they're adults. So, um, the probably the first year. So if they hatch in, in your yard or your neighbor's yard, the young ones leave and they probably don't really come back right to your yard. They may come back a, a, a short distance away, a few miles or something like that. But, but then once they, an adult has come, they very often will return to, uh, to, to the same yard. Uh, they, they, um, they're pretty faithful to their their territory. Just to add to that, since uh, uh, the Southeastern Arizona Bird Observatory, we're in our 26th season of banding hummingbirds on the San Pedro River here in Southeastern Arizona. This is a, a wild area, so it's a little different from an urban habitat, but we have found that there is an extremely strong tendency for our hummingbirds to come back year after year after year. We have hummingbirds that have visited that same area as breeding birds, local breeding birds on the San Pedro River. Uh, we had a female that was at least 10 years old when we last saw her and uh, we caught her over nine years. There's also been some very interesting banding studies in the Southeastern US where more and more hummingbirds are overwintering 
that's finding again that they have a very, very strong attachment to their wintering site. Not all of them, some of them will pick up and move anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred miles from one winter to the next, but they're finding that they're having very, very uh, good returns of birds over and over again to the same backyard. Again, up to nine winters in a row for some of these individual birds. That's incredible. <laughs> Especially when we're talking about birds that way. Right. Just, there was just a, a time when people that... wouldn't, wouldn't have believed that they lived that long, <laughs> but they do. <laughs> Um, Sherry, I, I actually want to ask you the next question, and this is about um, going back to some of the other birds and mammals that you mentioned using feeders. Can you speak to the interactions of, say, orioles and warblers with hummingbirds, as well as the mammals? Um, do they get along? Is there, should we keep them separate other than the disease aspect? Uh, if you could just speak to that aspect, that'd be great. Well, there, there's not a whole lot that you can do to, uh, to allow hummingbirds to use feeders while excluding uh, larger birds. You can put uh, your feeders inside cages. If you use the right size wire, the hummingbirds can get through, but the bigger birds like orioles and woodpeckers or mammals like um, uh, the first one that comes to mind for me because there's something that's in our own yard is the nectar feeding bats that we have down here along the Mexican border. But, uh, but flying squirrels are a, a, a feeder raider. Of course, they do it mostly at night. Uh, but you can cage your feeders in if you want to exclude those larger birds and, and mammals that may be visiting the hummingbird feeders. But generally, they're not too much of a problem. The bigger birds do sometimes slop the sugar water and that can create uh, problems with ants gathering and can attract bees. But but in general, there's not too much of an issue, but it does mean because you want to avoid cross-contamination between any diseases or parasites that the bigger birds may be carrying and hummingbirds, you do want to make sure that if you have other species of birds visiting your feeders besides hummingbirds, that you pay extra attention to them and keep them extra clean. So on a related note, can you then talk about how far away hummingbird feeders should be given aggressive males? Oh gosh, you know, you almost can't get them far enough apart. If you have a really diligent male, he'll find that one perch in the entire yard where he can see every feeder in the yard and he'll try to defend them all. Uh, there was actually a really cool study that was done uh, in uh, Tucson by a student at the University of Arizona who she did a, a community science project where she asked people to put out uh, to uh, uh, put out feeders in their yard or if they had flowers in their yard to monitor the birds using the flowers and feeders and to monitor the interactions between the birds. And then she had the people who had feeders out do experimental placements where they were either placed as far apart as possible or as close together as possible. And counterintuitively, when you place them very, very close together, you cluster four or five or six feeders in one spot, you're more likely to get at least brief detente in the hummingbird wars, rather than having them just you know constantly battling each other. You may still have one bird that wants to defend all those feeders, but because they're clustered and because while the bully bird is chasing off bird A, bird C, D, E, F, and G can feed, uh, and uh, vice versa, when it comes back to chase off another bird, the other birds can come back in and feed. So clustering your feeders very tightly having a cluster of shepherd's crooks or putting them on a clothesline or something strung across your garden where they're just a matter of a couple of feet apart. That seems to be the best strategy for thwarting the, the global domination ambitions of certain male hummingbirds. <laughs> David, maybe you can follow that up and talk about hummingbird territory and uh, breeding displays and such, uh, given that all of these males seem to congregate. Uh, do they have a lot of overlapping or, you know, would you only see one hummingbird in a square block or something? Well, it, it uh, hummingbird territory size is, is going to, to vary quite a lot. And it depends, of course, on resources. Um, if you have an area with, um, with a lot of flowers and, and a lot of habitat, then, then they'll, they'll uh, be in a smaller area. And, and uh, some hummingbirds actually cover very large areas. They'll, they'll actually fly uh, quite long distances from, from uh, flower to flower. So, so it sort of depends on, on both the kind of hummingbird and, and, um, and, uh, and the density of, of resources. 
So probably um, most places you probably won't won't get uh, a density that's going to be higher than than uh, oh uh, uh, you know one hummingbird nest per acre or something like that. Uh, to, to, to get a higher density than that, um, you're you're going to have to have good good resource. But some places they will, um, and of course so. Um, so the the uh, you will see the the males displaying, especially uh, early in the spring when they when the the females are are arriving and all the males are trying to uh, to attract a female and uh, that those displays can be uh, pretty impressive with all the aerial acrobatics and and uh, things that they do. Thanks, David. So Tim, I'm hoping that we can keep this train of thought going and you can share. Um, now that we've talked about territory, we want to talk about nesting. Um, and we have a, a participant who really wants to know what plants would be great to encourage that not just feeding, but nesting. So I know it'll you know, be a variety of answers based on location, but if you have any you know, great suggestions of even groups of plants to help with that, we want the hummingbird nests. Um, I could give a, a half-informed answer, but I think that I think that would be a great one for for Sherry. She probably knows hummingbird biology about as good as anybody, Sherry and David. So if one of them want to take it, that would probably be better. Well, my general recommendation for uh, for nesting habitat for hummingbirds is they do tend to prefer broadleaf trees. Uh, some of the birds in the Rocky Mountains and Pacific Northwest will nest in conifers, and that may be your preference, uh, their preference uh, if you're in the Rocky Mountains or the Pacific Northwest. But in most cases, uh, ruby throated black chins, a lot of the common widespread hummingbird species, annas, allens on the Pacific coast, they all seem to like to nest in broadleaf trees. So knowing when your hummingbirds are nesting is important if it's Resident Allen's hummingbirds, you want an evergreen tree that's going to have leaves all year round. If it's if they are only present in the summer, then you can have a deciduous tree, a maple or an ash or an oak or something like that, that has a good uh, leafy canopy for protection of the nests during the, the prime breeding season. And then, you know, consult the Plants for Birds database so that you can pick out exactly which broadleaf trees are, are best for your area. Thanks, Sherry. So we're getting a question that's coming in uh, that's making me think now would be a great time for you all to share some of your favorite hummingbird facts. The participant talked about how do these small hummingbirds survive the winter and some even have torpor. So that that first of all is, is a really cool fact in my opinion. Um, and so maybe uh, Sherry or David, you can talk about that. And then afterwards we can share some some other really cool facts about hummingbirds. Go ahead, David. Yeah, so so um, there are hummingbirds all over the Americas that live in places that can be pretty cold. I mean, even in, in uh, South America, for example, the, the hummingbird that was behind Gemma Radko uh, when she was showing it, the, the South American one, lives actually at very high altitude where it's very cold at night, uh, at night especially. Uh, and then, of course, some live all the way to Alaska um, and, um, and Yukon Territory and, and elsewhere in, in Canada. So, so hummingbirds naturally live in these places that can be pretty cold. So they have an adaptation, one that's very common in these kinds of hummingbirds is, is called torpor. It's, um, it's kind of a mini hibernation. It's so so at night, especially when it's cold and the hummingbird is not moving, um, they will actually lower their body metabolism metabolism and and uh, body temperature so to save energy because of course hummingbirds an active hummingbird is using a fast amount of energy for for a little animal. So, so they actually will be able to, to lower their uh, energy use at night. And uh, so in a lot of cold places, that's, that's the, the way they're able to survive. So um, 
so hummingbirds that are in places where maybe they normally wouldn't have been that it's cold. So for example, uh, the hummingbirds that are wintering on the Gulf Coast and so forth. I mean, they're doing the same thing, but they also are very dependent on, on hummingbird feeders. The, the hummingbird feeders, the, the, the hummingbirds that, that live at high altitudes, as I was mentioning, or in Alaska, of course, they're living in places where there are flowers. I mean, that's, they, they're, they're naturally used to that. But the hummingbirds that went over winter on the Gulf Coast are, are probably pretty heavily dependent on, on uh, hummingbird feeders because there, there wouldn't be flowers uh, for them. But they use the same strategy of, of lowering their metabolism at night. Thanks, David. Um, I want to make sure that I get Tim to share more about the app and any Audubon resources. Folks are writing in both about their own yards, but also uh, community or school gardens. So if you could share just a little bit more, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess uh, best the, what I would recommend is for folks to, to get on Google and to Google Plants for Birds, Audubon Society. And uh, you'll, you'll come to the, the main landing page. And um, one of the first links you'll see as you scroll down is the um, Plants for Birds database. And um, so remember that Audubon Society Plants for Birds. And uh, you should be able to uh, pretty easily find um, a spot where you can enter your zip code. And it will give you a long list of, of um, plant species and that are that favor native plants and um, the the database is for all sorts of different types of birds whether they're seed eating birds or or uh, nectar uh, feeding birds but each of the different plant species will be described it will be uh, there'll be some icons at the bottom of the plant of the species description that tell you which type of birds um, will be attracted to that type of plant whether it's a whether it's pollinators um, or seed eating birds such as sparrows and whatnot. Um, and it also uh, will provide you with a link to a local resource where you can um, potentially purchase uh, native plants in your, in your region, in your area. So there's an enormous resource there. I'd, so that's what I would do. Um, I guess I, I wanted to, since, since folks were asking about hummingbirds in winters, I just wanted to add one other, uh, one other bit, and that is that. Um, Aside from working with the hummingbirds at home data, I also work with the Christmas bird count data. And one thing that's kind of been interesting is that over the last 40 years or so, um, the number of hummingbirds in the southern fringe of the United States has been increasing considerably, exponential increases. And it has, a, a, I'm assuming it's a combination of what David was saying before, there are more and more folks putting hummingbird resources out there for birds in the winter. And then also we're having a warmer, warmer and warmer winters over the last 40 years. And so the combination of feeding and warmer temperatures is leading to these really interesting increases all across uh, the Gulf states and the Southwest, so. That's fascinating. I, I know that um, here in the DC area, we've definitely been having a few more Western species come out as well. So they're doing an East-West movement as well as that North-South. So really, thank you for raising that, Tim. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna ask our last question now in the interest of time. Um, and that is just if our panelists could please share if there's one thing that they really want all of our viewers to take away or learn or tell a friend about hummingbirds, what would it be? So I'm just gonna give you a second. And if David, if you could go first. Um, I just think that um, that one of the key things about getting hummingbirds in, in your yard is, is native plants. I, mean, I think that, uh, that planting native plants, uh, flowers of the species the, the, that hummingbirds like is really, really a key to to making hummingbirds happy and getting hummingbirds in your garden and, and uh, everybody will be happy. That's wonderful. And I totally agree. <laughs> Sherry, if you could go next. 
Well, I have to second what David said, of course. Uh, native plants are, are so very important, uh, but, but I, I would definitely add, you know, whatever you can plant that hummingbirds will be attracted to, go ahead and plant it. But if you're going to keep out feeders, please, please, please keep them clean. That's so important to prevent disease transmission, to make sure that, that the birds are healthy and that we're not doing harm by trying to do good. So feeders have to be kept clean. Thanks, Sherry. Tim? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm calling in today from Boulder, Colorado, and we're getting another spring storm. And nice. I guess one thing that I would encourage folks is that um, once you start putting out your feeders for the year that you're consistent with keeping them full, especially on the shoulder seasons when the birds might encounter some really freak weather and really, really rely on that resource. So. Thank you all. So again, unfortunately, our time has come to an end, uh, but thank you everyone for attending and for all of your wonderful questions. Before we end, I have a special announcement for ABC, and that is that yesterday, American Bird Conservancy launched a campaign to raise $500,000 by June 30th of this year in support of bird conservation programs that help protect hummingbirds and other species. Thanks to a dedicated group of supporters, we're offering a one-to-one -one match toward our goal. So please help us please help us reach it by making a gift in the link shared in the chat now and in our follow-up email with the recording. And we really appreciate your consideration and support for birds. So again, with that, we'll now end the webinar. And I really hope that you all see hummingbirds soon in your yard. Thank you. <laughs>